Lesson from the Epistle of Blessed Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. Brethren, know you not that they run in the race, all run indeed, one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain, and every one that striveth for the mastery, refrain himself from all things, and they indeed that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible one. <coughs> I therefore so run, not as at an uncertainty. I so fight, not as one beating the air. But I chastise my body and bring it into subjection. Lest perhaps when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. For I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all in Moses were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. And they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like to a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And having agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And he said to them, Go you also into my vineyard, and I will give you what shall be just. And they went their way. And again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did in like manner. But about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. He said to them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They say to him, Because no man hath hired us. He said to them, (coughs) Go you also into my vineyard. And when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and pay them their hire, beginning from the last even to the first. When therefore they were come that came about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first also came, they thought that they should receive more, and they also received every man a penny. And receiving it, they murmured against the master of the house, saying, These last have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us that have borne the burden of the day and the heat. But he answering said to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take what is thine and go thy way. I will also give to this last even as to thee. Or is it not lawful for me to do what I will? Is thy eye evil because I am good? So shall the last be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thus far the words of the Holy Gospel. couple announcements here. Um, there's a group that pl- prays the rosary at the Civic Center. Uh, they'll be there. Um, uh, it's between Garden Grove Boulevard and Stanford on Euclid on February 13th at 12 noon. Uh, so there's a bulletin thing there. But anyway, if you want to join them, go and be there February 13th at the Garden Grove Civic Center. Uh, The people in Northridge would like to invite anybody from here that would like to go up there for their third annual Feast Before Fast Potluck, Sunday, February 7th, 2016. Um, And uh, there's information on what kind of dishes and bring and what to do and things like that. That's always a, a very nice event. The um, Women's Society will be sponsoring the 6th Annual Parish Lenten Soup Dinners starting February 12th through March 18th. Um, we, these, are on, these are Fridays, the, the Friday evenings. Uh, we need volunteers to make soup and help in the kitchen. Please contact Benita Piero to sign up. See Sunday Bulletin for further information. There should be a sign-up sheet in the back. Yeah, there is. So you don't really have to contact Benita directly. But if you'd like to, there's Benita. 
the, okay, um, to wait till after mass to, to contact her. And there's a sign-up sheet. Now, please, people, look at um, Okay. Every year, we do this. Now, look at the number of people standing around here. There are three people who do everything every year. There are more people who sign up and never show up to help clean up or help do anything. They'll sign the sheet already. Now, you sign that sheet. I know a lot of you are doing nothing, okay? Because I know what your, your life's like. Oh, I volunteer. To, oh, I volunteer at, you know, the, the, the local gymnasium to help wash the walls or something. Okay, charity begins at home. If you volunteer anywhere, you start here. And if you want to volunteer somewhere else after you've done your duty to your God in your parish, then you go and do your duty somewhere else. But I'm sick and tired of having to beg a whole churches full of people, three masses on Sunday full, to come and help with something as simple as a little parish event. Why should I have to beg you? You know, remember our faith teaches faith and good works? Can you point, I would like anybody after Mass to point out all the good works you're doing to me, okay? I, I, I invite you to do that, all right? And if it, your list is a little paltry, a little slim, then I suggest you take the message of today's epistle and gospel and start running for that prize because you're not saved by sitting there like bumps on a log every Sunday. That's only half of it, okay? So, do you understand me? <laughs> okay. Um, three people who run these things. Now, the idea is, it's a it's a meant, it's a meat free um, soup di dinner. So you have soup, you have bread, and things like that. Um, and it's it, you know we get together on on Fridays and and do this during Lent. So it's not a big commitment. You have to either cook or help set up or clean up or something like that. But um, anyway, and you're encouraged to come and you give a donation to the church for this. And we, uh, so anyway. Um, the other thing, finally, is that Sunday, April 17th, uh, is the day for confirmations. So any of you who require confirmation, who haven't been confirmed yet, um, this is your opportunity. Bishop Tissier de Malare will be in Colton at 11 o'clock on uh, Sunday, April 17th. So we will have a sign up for that. Um, I know most of you are, that need confirmation are in religious instruction, but there are some people here who are a little older, just slipped through the cracks and were never confirmed. Um, this is your opportunity to receive that sacrament. So let us, uh, when we put up the sign-ups, which will be the, the, the religious education people, we'll, we'll put those out for next Sunday, and you'll be able to sign up for that. Okay. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. My dear faithful, we now have entered the season of Septuagesima. Uh, the season of Septuagesima has uh, Septuagesima Sunday, and then there's Sexagesima, then there's Quinquagesima, and finally after that, Ash Wednesday and, and Lent begins. Now, the, the origins of it, Septuagesima means the 70th, but it really has no origin in anything that was 70 anything. It was just that certain religious orders in the old days were given permission to start Lent, the, the fastings and the penance of Lent earlier. And so they noted that by this, this season of Septuagesima. And it really, the numbering Septuagesima, Sexagesima, Quinquagesima, it, it, it doesn't signify what the name means. What it means, the whole season is Septuagesima until Ash Wednesday. What it is for the rest of us, remember this is only religious orders that were given permission to start the fasting early. What it means for the rest of us is that uh, it's a heads up because the season of Lent is coming. 
And the season of Lent is very enigmatic for modern Catholics. Um, and, I mean, we're modern Catholics, meaning we're living in the modern world, not that, that we're doing modern things. That's not what I mean by that. The reason why it's enigmatic is over the centuries, the, the penances imposed by the church have dwindled down to just about nothing. Yet we are exhorted by the epistle and the gospel today to be mindful of, uh, really it's a preparation for Lent, be mindful of the fact that Lent is a, day, is a season to get our act in order with regards to us and our spiritual lives and, and God. So what we take it as then is a time not to start our penances seriously or, or you know, hardcore right now. That's still reserved for Lent. But that we're going to do something for Lent by way of offering things for our, for our salvation, some sort of mortification or whatever. And why do we have to decide that for ourselves? Well, the church now requires two days of penance, basically, in the year of major, major penance. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are days of both fasting and abstinence. The modern rules of the church require no other major penance requiring fasting than those two. And I guarantee you, if your whole uh, outlook on fasting, the, the, your scope of it, your limit, is, is limited to those two days, I don't know if you're going to make it. I really don't. Because the life of a Catholic who wants to go to heaven is delineated, first of all, by St. Paul in the epistle. And these are things to think about um, as we approach Lent. What are you going to do? What is going to be your penance? Now, some people go, well, you know, I, I gave up pickled herring or something, you, you know. Well, giving up some token little thing like that is what we were taught as infants, okay? If the infant of the family wants to give up some token little thing like that, good. You know, give up, give up chocolate bars or something like that. When you're an adult, though, you know, it's like St. Paul says in another reading, you know, when I was a child, I did things as a child, essentially recapping it. But when I grew up, I did things as an adult. We need to approach the, the self-imposed penances of Lent as adult Catholics who are mindful of our frail nature and of our tendency to sin and of the sins we've committed into, in the past. So there's an element of the fasting and, and penance, whatever you choose to do, whatever the penance is. But the elements of penance are uh, twofold. We offer that up in reparation for our past sins that may have not been sat, done, you know, satisfied sufficiently according to God's justice. We also offer them up to bring ourselves into, into subjection in the spiritual life. So that is whatever penance you're choosing, um, you know, it, that has to, those two goals have to be um, what you're aiming at there. So we have this reading then, just that's the, I wanted to kind of just go over this reading because uh, the, the gospel, so it clearly in the epistle, um, St. Paul is, is telling us, look, this is, this is a race, people, you need to understand you want to go to heaven, you have to approach it like an Olympic athlete. He, it's clear. I don't know how Protestants love St. Paul so much and then kind of ignore this message of his. They think, oh, everybody, I, I confess Jesus, I'm going to heaven. And St. Paul says quite the opposite. He goes, look at, look at these runners. And he was a runner. That's why he uses that analogy. A, an athlete and a competitive runner at one point in his life. So he uses an analogy that was very dear to him. And he says, look at these runners. How, and once again, I'm kind of paraphrasing. Look how they defend themselves. They deny themselves. They do everything to gain that prize, the crown. And that, he says, is an earthly crown. You have to be willing to do the same and more to gain the heavenly crown. 
he, he, you know, and think about it. We all know because of, remember Jim McKay and up close and personal and the Olympics of old, we, how they would go and talk to the individual athletes. We know what they give up. You know, um, uh, these athletes, the swimmers and stuff, every single day, a very restricted kind of special diet. They get up at some ungodly hour, like most of us had to today, <laughs> maybe even earlier. And they did that day in and day out so they could win a medal, all right? Now, the prize we're going after is, a medal is garbage compared to it. All the gold in the world is garbage compared to what we're going after. So think about what you have to do, which is any, we all have to do anything it takes to win this prize. Now, in the, um, in the gospel, our Lord gives us a parable about how we should, we should view certain aspects of this. So he, he has the householder, the boss of, of the place, and he is inviting people into his, his vineyard and to, for pay to work and taking care of the vineyard. So obviously the householder is God. All right, and so what does he do first? He calls. How does he call? When does he call? Well, he calls people in, in various ways. But remember, God calls everyone. You know, even the, the, the direst pagan in the middle of the Amazon is given, we believe, sufficient grace to save their soul by God in one way or another. Okay? You know there are tribes in the Amazon that have never seen white people, let alone heard of the Catholic Church or seen a missionary. But they will receive a call in one form or another from our Lord. Now how does he call normally? He calls through um, inward inspiration. He calls us, this is calling to what? Calling to work in the vineyard, which is his church, to be part of his church. <coughs> So he calls through inspirations, spiritual books, um, other people. You could be very well the instrument of God's calling a worker into his vineyard, yourself. Because you talk to people and I'm, oh, I'm a Catholic. And, oh, well, tell me more about this Catholic thing. That's how God does it, okay? So we have the householder, God, calling in various ways. When? at various times. You know, the people who were there were called first, those would be a lot of us here, the cradle Catholics, okay? The cradle Catholics were the ones called early on in the day. And then as it goes on, he calls people at various stages until finally the 11th hour. The 11th hour would be uh, deathbed conversions, possibly, okay, to, to, to the church. And he ends up paying each of them the same. Uh, this is an, an, one of the unfortunate things, I think, about the Douay translation, Douay Rheims. I don't think there are many unfortunate things about them. But one of them is it was translated by an Englishman who used the money of the day in place of the real term that was in the Bible. The real term in the Bible was a denarius, and they probably couldn't see it in them to just leave a foreign word in, in, the, in the translation. But a denarius was the standard coin for a day's work. You paid somebody a denarius. So all of these people, whether they were called early in life or at the end of their life, get the pay, the same pay, and that pay is the kingdom of heaven. So what does our Lord say to us there? Um, he goes and asks them, these people, why have you been standing all day idle? This is the 11th hour, the 11th hour people. And what is idle? You go, well, I'm not idle, I'm at mass, okay? Well, yeah, and, and, and obviously that's not being exactly idle, especially this early mass. I think there's like extras for going to the early mass. You get more grace or something for you know, dragging yourself here. I like to think that <laughs> because getting up and going, oh Lord, there has to be some reward for this one, because uh, I'm not a morning person. But the, the um, 
Idleness. There are different ways of being idle that we have to ask ourselves. What does idle mean? Okay, there are basically three ways to be idle. You do nothing, or you do evil, or you do things inadequately. You do them half-heartedly. Okay? So, our, the message there is, why stand you all day idle? That we ask ourselves, am I being idle? Am I doing things not at all? Am I doing some sort of evil, a sin? Or am I doing things inadequately? That's one question. Now he sends them out into the vineyard to work. Now think of a vineyard. I like to think of the end product. But think of the vineyard, because <laughs> the end product was late. We have, they go out, and there's a lot of things. You have these vines on the trellises, or however they are. They have to be trimmed, they have to be fertilized, tended to, and the dead ones have to be rooted up, dug up by the roots and tossed out. Okay, and then later on, you know, you do the same thing at the end of the season, you prune them all back to nothing and the whole thing starts all over again. Well, that's our spiritual life. When we're in the church, we're tending, you know, our, our Lord ultimately is, is, is the vine in, symbolically, and we're grafted onto that vine for, for our eternal life. But we have to do the same thing with our spiritual lives. We have to fertilize it. Good reading, prayers. We have to um, uproot the vices. If, if something's in there, if we have sins, we have to uproot them. We have to get rid of them. We have to tend that vine. And at the end of it, we'll receive our reward. Now, our Lord makes this a couple enigmatic statements. Um, he says, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. And this is directed towards the Jews. Because the Jews were the, the ones called by God from long, long ago, yet they did not accept the Messiah. And the last ones called were the Gentiles, the Christians, who accepted him. And the, but the, la, the first will be last, because we also believe that the end of time, the Jews will convert and receive that same denarius of eternal glory that those of us who had labored all, all the time, sometimes since we were babies, in that vineyard. So my dear faithful, um, Septuagesima is upon us. How are we going to live a good Lent? Um, now, the other thing is, knowing uh, human nature from knowing myself, when you choose something, you know, choose something reasonable that you can actually do. Now, what's, what is reasonable? Well, almost anything I think you can, you can think of is, is probably reasonable. In the old days, when my grandparents were alive, and some of you are old enough that when your parents were alive, and maybe even when you were alive, um, you know, some 80, 90 years ago, I know there's one person here that's at least 90, so I won't tell you who it is, but because she keeps on saying 39. Um, in those days, the penance imposed by the church was fasting every single day of Lent outside of Sunday. The church considered that doable. That is why it imposed it. And you know what? People who understood the church and the nature of the church did it. They obeyed. They kept to that. Okay? So anything from there on down, um, custom tailored to your personal requirements. If you have blood sugar problems, you know, nothing I say practically is a universal except when it con concerns God and his nature. You have to be reasonable. If you have blood sugar problems, you don't fast yourself into some sort of, you know, wh whatever blood sugar crash would lead you to and, and coma or something like that. And finally, what I want to say, my dear faithful, knowing human nature, if you blow it, you get back on the wagon. <laughs> Lent is 40 days excluding Sundays. Uh, if you blow it, you simply get back on the wagon. You do not make your penance as long as it's outside of Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. You do not make your penance um, a promise or something under pain of mortal sin. Do not do that. 
So if you blow it, you've disappointed yourself, um, and you get right back up on the bicycle, okay? And you keep on going. And that, so now we have a few weeks about how we're going to approach Lent. Um, in the meantime, pray for enlightenment. What does your particular vine need to be tended to for your spiritual life? And you pray for the fortitude to adhere to that through a good and holy Lent. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.